Amen. So um, I'm going to have you open up your Bibles today. We're going to continue in. Um, hold, hold on. Oh, my. <laughs> I don't know why Siri just kicked on. <laughs> it was talking about stocks, investments. <clears throat> okay, Siri's acting up again. I tell you, when it comes to technology, it's a, a lot of fun around here, huh? So we're still in Ephesians. We're in the last part of chapter 5. We're going to look at the rest of that and um, pick up there. I hope it's on the screen. If not, in your Bibles, we'll start at 15, verse 15. You're going to be able to get that up there, you guys? Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so Ephesians 5, and then specifically looking at uh, and starting at verse 15. So Paul, at, at this point, has been driving home the idea that the Christian should live what he believes. Amen? And that makes sense if you think about it. If you believe something enough, and people have, if you go around and do surveys or just talk to people and get their opinions about whatever, people have a lot, people have strong convictions about things. But what doesn't usually happen is that those supposed beliefs that they say they have, they usually won't, and I'll say it this way, they won't hang their bodies on it. They don't make the commitment to actually live what they believe. That's pretty much kind of like uh, what you can call hypocrisy. You, you're willing to speak real strongly about a certain thing, but you, your life doesn't reflect those beliefs. What Paul is trying to do is say, hey, church, as a believer, we're to, we're to live what we believe. So then the first thing that we would have to do is know what we believe. Amen? Either believe it or we don't. I would think that it's kind of a, really a waste of life if you can't find something to, it, to attach to and live that way. Amen? It's kind of like you're just tossed into the wind and you're thrown back and forth like the waves. You, you, go, you go back and forth and you're, you're just out there um, just dangling, a whole lifetime of just dangling I think it's important as a Christian to know what we believe. Paul spent the first three chapters of this book telling us who God is, speaking to us about really profound uh, ideas like election, um, like the sovereignty of God, our free will, and yet the whole plan of salvation. So he explains to us what God has done, who he is, and the question would be is do we understand that and what that means to us? The implications of walking with God are, are very important. They, they should have an impact and they should have an influence in our lives. Amen? And our lives should be a model of what we say we believe. So we spend a lot of time here digging through God's Word, but hopefully, by God's grace, we can grab a hold of something and start practicing it. You know, there's always the first steps, if you will. And as we go, go longer with the Lord, those things become more natural. We, we just kind of do them, and hopefully they're driven by our love for Him, motivated by our trusting Him. Amen? So Paul uh, will, go, will tell us a little bit about that today. If you just look at the first uh, section up there, we'll just kind of uh, look at that together. If you don't mind standing with me, I'm going to read it. It says uh, the following, uh, starting at verse 15 of Chapter 5 of Ephesians. I'm getting closer because I need to see it. <laughs> it's back there? No, up here only. So it says, look carefully then how you walk, not as un unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the, uh, to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, let's pray for His blessing today. 
Dear Lord, we thank you again for this time here this morning, uh, our time to uh, worship you and to listen to your word. We pray, Father, for the help of the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and we can acknowledge, Lord, in, in our hearts, Father, what you're telling us and pray, Lord, for the help to live in a way that is pleasing to you. That's what we want to do. We want to please you, Lord. We want to be able to take from what we, we learned today and allow it to uh, increase our faith so that we can be ultimately faithful witnesses of what the gospel of Jesus Christ means to our lives. And we will thank you for that, Lord. We have seen, we ask your protection in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's look at this. And as you know how I like to do it, verse by verse, uh, the way this one off is look carefully, then how you walk. You could easily put the word live instead of walk. Your walk, your life. Look, look carefully at, at how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. So the original meaning literally was walk carefully. Does anybody here like to walk and you're not really paying attention to where you're walking? <laughs> I've been known to run into a couple poles on the sidewalk. I'm like looking around and bam. So the idea here, uh, if you use the King James Version, it says walk circumspectly cir from the word uh, circumference. Be aware of your surroundings is what he's saying. Be, be aware of your behavior is what he's really addressing, right? And he mentions not as unwise but as wise. So if you're if you walk carefully, then what the Lord is uh, addressing here is, let's use the wisdom that God's given us. Amen? I mean, a lot of you, um, most of you, I could say, have been coming here for, for a good amount of time and a decent amount of time hearing God's Word. Amen? Maybe you're going to some of our Bible uh, studies. Well, all of that if we don't take it and apply it to our lives, is what he's referring to. In other words, hopefully we're learning things as Christians. We should be every day, all the time. Because the Lord speaks to us. You know, there are moments and there are times when we, we get into God's Word and all of a sudden something just kind of like we can say, wow, that's for me. Has anyone ever had that phenomenon happen? It's like, did Pastor Robert follow me around? <laughs> right? Nope, I'm not. The Lord, though, He's aware of your life. Amen. And if you belong to Him, He's consistently trying to speak to you about whatever it is that He wants you to give attention to for your benefit. So, look carefully or walk carefully. Um, nowadays, I mean, I think it'd be unwise not to be aware of your surroundings. Right? I mean, people out there, there's just threats out there. There's danger out there. Amen? So in this case, uh, we're to walk carefully and be aware of, of, our, uh, of our, our surroundings. And, and most importantly, uh, our behavior. And also, use the wisdom that God's given us. Does anyone here feel like they're wiser since they've known the Lord? Okay, good. Um, I try to be careful sometimes. But, okay, I'll say it like this. Before knowing the Lord, I did some really dumb stuff. Does anyone here can say that? That's all I can. I, I'm going to say it that way. If, when I don't consider the Lord, when I don't think about what I've learned from the Lord, and then I go out and live my life kind of like maybe setting him aside for a while, and I do my own thing, how many of us usually do dumb stuff? That's what he's telling us to do. We need to be aware. And then he bounces to the next idea here. You'll notice that there's one idea after another idea here. And I, I like, he says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So that's a reference to to make the most of every opportunity that God gives us, right? We don't want to waste time. 
We don't want to um, make the worst of our time. We want to make the best of it. Why? Because the days are evil. One of the words here where it says making the best use, the King James, where when I learned this as a younger man, when I was using the King James Version, not the ESV like now, the word there is redeeming the time. In other words, buy up the countless opportunities that God has given you to glorify Him. I remember that um, around 19 or 20, in spite of the fact that I had to re- been raised in a Christian home, um, my high school years were wasted years as far as my faith was concerned. That may be true for a lot of you. And I can say this, when I finally made a commitment to Christ, I really put a lot of urgency into trying to catch up, trying to make up for all the wasted years. You ever heard of that concept, that idea that people say, man, I wasted so many years. I'm going to do everything I can now to, to redeem it. And that's what the word is originally in the King James, at least how I learned it, to buy back. You're trying to restore and make up for the, the wasted years. Now let's every, let us as Christians, as believers, let every moment be for the benefit and for the glory of God. In other words, let's not waste our time. And specifically, he says, because the days are evil. You know what that means. Days are evil is a reference to the fact that the Lord's coming is soon. The evil days as we see them today are an indicator, a sign to us that the end is close. As they get worse and worse and worse, that means that we have less time to to do something for the Lord. And whether it be in our service, in our testimony, in our sharing the gospel, So let's not waste the opportunity. Let's use our time wisely. It's easy to say as an older man, because I can look ahead and see that there's, just fact of the matter is, there's less years, right? Sometimes I think about, and not that I would look at my watch per se, but sometimes I think, okay, so I'm 63. I could probably go, go hard another 10 years. And then around 73, I'm probably going to start to slow down. Sam says that I'm breathing slow. He goes, Dad, you're... I told him I had a bad chest cold. You know, what are you trying to say, Sam? You know? But those of you that are young, you probably think, man, I got all the time in the world. All the time in the world. No, you don't. Nobody does. All we have is today. Right? All we have is now. Make the best of it for God's glory. No, we just we'll do that tomorrow. You don't know if you'll have tomorrow, and you don't know if the opportunity that you had today if that door will close. So that's what Paul's trying to say: making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. So, away with foolishness, which is part of wasting time, right? Because you can only be foolish within the time frame. Away with the foolishness. And hey, what about, why don't we seek or why don't we desire to find out what God's will is? Let's try and understand what the will of the Lord is. Because here's what I do have to say about that. God has a perfect will for your life. There is a way, there is a will of God that we're to understand, and I will tell you it's perfect. You would be foolish not to look for it. It would be foolish not to seek it, not to ask God, hey God, what is your will for me? Because what you're really doing then is wasting time, because you're living outside or below the level of God's perfect will for yourself. In other words, there's a level of God's will for your life that's better than your own will. Sometimes we're living in our own will. Now, there is a, no doubt we have to search for it. But I believe that God is faithful in showing us and opening doors because wouldn't He be the one that knows 
us better than, than we know ourselves? And wouldn't He be the one concerned with showing us if we simply would just ask Him? Uh, Jesus said to His disciples, you have not because you ask not. How about asking the Lord, like right now where you're sitting in your heart, Lord, what's your perfect will for my life? And if you would show it to me so that, because I desire to live there. And I promise you, that's the best place that you can live. Unfortunately, one of the things you learn at 63 is that you can look back and see those times of your life when you were outside of His will, and you can recognize and accept that wasn't good. Okay? So, these are like quick little things that Paul is saying to this church. And he's saying, hey, don't be foolish, but hey, understand what the will of the Lord is. And then, then he gets into uh, an activity that's probably, of all things, one of the most foolish. Guess what it is? Do not get drunk with wine. Isn't that interesting? Kind of, some people might say, that's a kind of an odd transition. No, because he's talking about being foolish in the verses before. He's talking about something that is a waste of time and is destructive to your life. And in some occasion, drunkenness, or in, the way he puts it here, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. And actually, I actually honestly had to look up the word debauchery. But it's, it's an extreme indulgence in carnal pleasures involving alcohol. It could be drugs. Anything you indulge that's uh, carnal, right? He's saying, don't get drunk with wine. Now, it's, it's, it's the extreme indulgence, right? Then, because he, that's a negative thing he's telling us, right? Don't do this negative thing. But the Lord always gives us a positive thing to do, right? One thing for another thing. And he, he, he gives us this word here in verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. See, drunkenness has no place in the life of the Christian. What we, if we're going to be filled with something... It used to be, I don't know uh, if some of you can remember, if you looked outside a liquor store, you would see the word spirits sold here. Spirits. So, you could be filled with the spirits of alcohol, or you could be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see what he's doing there? I remember that. Uh, you don't see it too often anymore, the word spirits. But this is what they call distilled alcohol, spirits. It's a whole industry. And art, they start talking about that the, uh, that the whiskey has been aged in, 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 in uh, uh, barrels of oak. Now they're taking those old barrels of oak and they're putting beer in it and letting it age in the old whiskey barrels so that it has a hint of the taste of whiskey in the beer. You, you see this stuff all the time advertised. And so you say, uh, well, what are you trying to get at? Hey, if you're going to be filled with something, instead of being filled with alcohol or with drugs or indulging yourself in carnal pleasures which are destructive, how about being filled with the Spirit? Right? Not with wine. And here's something uh, I think worthy considering. There's really no secret to successful Christian living than to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing I could tell you. But how do I do this? How do I live the Christian life? It's really only one way. And that's allowing yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit. You have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Right? Right? It's like your relationship with your loved ones or your friends, family. If you're always like this when you're in their presence and they're talking, you're talking to them and they're like this, are they being sensitive to you? Do they even hear you? Because a lot of times they'll go like this. Huh? What? You're talking to me? 
Well, that's what we do with the Holy Spirit. He's trying to speak to us, but we're so distracted with everything else that we don't hear His voice. We, we don't give Him the importance that He should have in our lives. And remember, we teach and preach that our faith is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with the living God who has chosen in what appears to be at least a mystery in filling us with the Holy Spirit. That was his promise to his disciples when he was going to leave this earth. He says, hey, hey, go to Jerusalem and wait for and receive the Holy Spirit. And that happened on the day of Pentecost. Let me read to you what he said in Acts 1, 8 to his disciples. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is, has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me. Once you receive that power, you can be a witness. Where? In Jerusalem. So in your inner circle. In Judea and further out of your inner circle. Samaria, even further out of your inner circle, and to the ends of the earth. So it goes from the inside. You've got to be first a witness in, in your home, at your workplace, right? And then maybe your neighbors, and further out if you go to school, and even to strangers further out. We become witnesses, but how? Because we receive power from the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever asked the Lord, hey Lord, help me to be more sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit? It starts with a prayer life. It starts with being in, having your own devotionals. It starts with being involved with listening to, first to God's Word, then applying that and talking to Him. There's no secret to success as far as being a Christian except for allowing yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? You shall receive what? Power. The word power in the Greek here is an interesting word. I learned it so many years ago. I don't have to write it down or memorize it or have notes. It was dunamis from where we get the word dynamite in English. He would give us dynamite power. Not some kind of like, little, are you a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> no. Power. Yes, with, with your life and your smile reflecting that power. I mean, I don't understand you. You've got all kinds of problems in your life, and, and yet you've still got joy, and you have peace about you. Oh, it's not me. It's God in me. God in us that gives us that power. Some people are not real sure about the Holy Spirit. Let me say it to you this way. We are aware of physical laws like gravity, for instance, right? They exist. Gravity exists. Yeah, it exists. The power of my hand lifted it up off of this little ledge. When I let go of it, it goes back to where it was. What, what power is that? That's gravity. Right? For instance, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that we protect ourselves from radiation, doing simple things like putting on the, the UV uh, sunblock, right? No, you don't see radiation. Why are you putting sunblock on? Because you feel it later. You don't see it. It's obviously in the light. But you put sunblock to push it out. Nobody ever questions that radiation can have a negative effect on you. Right? Something outside of yourself. Just like gravity, if I'm not careful and I walk over here and without considering this step, I'm going to fall to the ground. And the law of gravity is no respecter of persons. It just will work. Another one too, and I, I learned this many years ago. Uh, I was reading a book uh, uh, of someone who talked about how, for instance, radiation like at a nuclear power plant how that the people there can, and, and sometimes we do when we get an x-ray, what do they put on us? Like at the dentist, they put this, I guess it's a jacket, a lead jacket that protects against the radiation. Do you know what would happen to you if you're exposed to radiation for a long enough time? 
Your cells are changed. Your cells change. No, it doesn't. It does. I, I'm, there's a reason. If you if you get a if you if you if there's a nuclear uh, exposure here at a San, San Onofre, I think it's closed now though. Maybe not. Orange County. Why are people warned about the cloud of radiation? Would it could it penetrate your body? Could it make an impact on your body? No, just go ask the people in Chernobyl, Russia, where there are now, even generations later, all kinds of birth defects. It goes and it changes the molecular, the part of your cells. Cancer. The law, a physical law that is in existence, it can be proven. Well, let me ask you this. What if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? A spiritual law, a spiritual reality, can it change you? Yeah, it can. If you're exposed to the Holy Spirit, it's gonna, that's how we're transformed. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus, how he could go into heaven, that he must be born again. The born again experience is the work of the Holy Spirit. He changes our heart. He, he changes us from the inside out. It's actually real. Just as the physical laws of this world are active and have their rules, so do the spiritual laws of God, but even more so because the physical rule, laws of this world are temporary. The spiritual rules or laws of God are eternal. That we have a soul, we have a spirit. Just look at a corpse. You know, uh, sad things about when one of our loved ones pass, you see their bodies there, but they're lifeless. Something left them. What was that? Their soul, their spirit. It's gone. One of the most difficult things to do in life is to see the departed one. That's why they say departed. What left? Their body's still there. The whole, the, that part of them that's eternal. Their soul. Our souls and our spirits, when touched by God's spirit, they change. Just like the laws of gravity have an impact, the laws of radiation have an impact physically, so does the Holy Spirit have an impact. It changes us. So, He's telling us, if you're going to be filled with something, better to be filled with the Spirit. Amen? And the promise of His Son, Jesus, before He left, was that He would give us the Holy Spirit. And then when He was with His disciples, just before He left, He said, receive the Holy Spirit. He, we have to actually receive it. We have to accept it. We have to embrace it. Have you tried it? If you're a Christian, you have, because you've invited Christ into your heart. Then he moves, Paul, and he says, Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does is it produces song in our soul. A song of gratitude, a song of praise, and their tributes to God for His wonderful gifts that He's given us, like the gift of salvation, the victories He's given us, the peace that He's given us, the joy. Have you ever met people that are just always sour and bitter and hateful and angry? It's like they're possessed by those things. Do they have a song in their hearts? No. You tell me that your attitude can impact how you behave. What you believe can impact what, how you behave. What's in you can impact how you behave. It's really funny about drunks. 
Some of them, when they're drunk, get happy. It's really funny. Let me say it was really funny. Yeah. And then when it wears out, and they have a hangover, they turn a different tune. But some people, when they're drunk, get melancholy. They cry. They're upset. It affects people differently. But the Holy Spirit, when we, He lives in us, He gives us a song. You ever run into those people, those Christian people, that are always, like, they're always happy and always smiling? I'll say it this way. They're drunk on the Spirit. That's what the disciples were accused of the day that the Holy Spirit fell on Pentecost by some of their critics. These are drunk and it's only midday. It's, it's got to be five o'clock somewhere. They were accused of being drunk because they were full of joy. That's the impact the Holy Spirit has. They have a, a song in their soul. When you're going through difficulties, you know what I recommend you do? I recommend you sing. I recommend when you're going through temptation or when you're going through a trial, you say, well, obviously you would pray, but you know what? What about singing? I have one. It changes you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of our great King. That's a psalm. I sing that when it, all of a sudden things fall on me and it changes my heart. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. You've been so faithful, Lord. Lord, you've been so true. You've never failed me, though I failed you. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. Bam! I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. Bam! I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. What do we have? A real God that we can trust in or not, who hears us and knows what we're going through and can help us in the time of need? Yes. Yes, trials come. Yes, people betray you. Yes, you can get sick. Yes, you might lose your job. But it doesn't matter. You still have Him. Why would He even bother saying all this stuff? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making a melody to the Lord with your heart. This is what the world does not have. You see what's going on in France right now? People are getting violent. Destroying things over their discontentment. Under their perception of their injustice. And there you see the difference when you act out in the flesh and you act out in the Lord? I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's just amazing. Fighting in the streets. Like that's gonna help. No, what helps is this. Be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms 
and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Sing. Why? Because you're singing praise to Him who can do something and has done something for you. You know there's nothing impossible for Him. Just praise Him. Right? And then it says in verse 20, giving thanks always. Now hold on a minute. Always? I, 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 we got to rip that out of the Bible. That just not, that's just not possible. Always? And if, that was, if always weren't enough, it says, and for everything. What? Give, what? Thanks always? No matter what? Unconditionally? In spite of your circumstances and whatever situation you're going through, you're still going to give thanks always? And if that doesn't cl clear it up, and for everything. Everything? Always? Yeah, you know why? Because of what Romans 8.28 says. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purposes. You know what that verse really means? When it says that all things, as it says here always and for everything, all things, no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, it can and will work out for good. Because the way I learned it many years ago from my pastor, and it stuck with me, was that God intervenes in spite of things. God can enter into your life where you're at with whatever it is you're going through, and He can make good out of it. That's who we serve, a God that's able to do that. He can make good out of it. He's an intervener. He is one who can enter in. He comes out from time and space, and He makes Himself present in our circumstances. That's who we serve. And if you don't believe that's who He is, then I ask you to do a check up from the neck up and a check down to the heart. And check yourself, because that's who He reveals Himself to be. Gosh, we don't need a weak image to worship or some silly concept that you conjured up. That's idolatry. We need to know the God of the Bible. What He's telling us here is that we're to give thanks always and for everything. Why? Because it's to God the Father and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He has already proven to us who He is. He's the creator of the universe. What an amazing universe. Just go over to Yosemite for a while. Or out to Lake Tahoe. And you can see His handiwork. But the greatest of His work is in His creation. It was the redemption that He provided us at Calvary's cross through His Son, Jesus Christ. He has done for us what we could not do for ourselves so that we might be redeemed and that we might escape the wrath that's coming and the condemnation that's coming. We're free from it because Jesus absorbed it on His body for us. He exchanged places with us and now we can walk from underneath that condemnation into freedom to serve Him and live for Him. Yeah, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul, like he always does, and it doesn't seem sometimes that there's a connection, then he jumps into relationships. And he says in verse 21, and I will say this for those of you, and there are a few of you in here, that I have done marriage counseling too and for. Thank you for allowing me. Funny how we can get into, let's say, for instance, the relationship between a husband and wife and begin to spell out, oh, this is what the wife should do and this is what the husband should do. And, but first, he says in tw verse 21 that we're to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. 
We're to submit to one another. You know what the, how relationships work in Christ? You cannot have a healthy one without humility. You have to surrender your rights for the benefit of the person that you love. You submit to them, by the way, freely. You don't, because God has a, a way to live. Because He designed us, He has a way for us to live. And the way for us to live is to submit ourselves to one another. Because you know what Jesus did when He came to this earth in, in, the, in the incarnation? He submitted to the will of His Father. Although being equal with the Father, He chose to set aside his divine prerogatives so that he could come as Jesus of Nazareth and go to the cross as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He submitted himself to the will of the Father. He humbled himself to serve the will of the Father and to serve us. The key to successful relationship is submission, is giving up your rights for the rights of the other person. You will never fight with that person because you want what's best for them. How can, what are you going to fight about? Here, honey, I brought you this nice cold glass of Coke. It's so hot out there. I know you've been cutting the grass. Oh, get away from me. That's terrible. Of course not. You're, they're looking out for you. Right? How would you ever do that? You go, wow, that's not really thoughtful. Thank you. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The key is this. We do it out of reverence for Christ. So uh, this is where we're going to do um, for the rest of this. Uh, well, actually, we're going to finish because we have the Lord's Supper. And then we'll move into wives and husbands next week. So if you're a wife, if you're, if you're a husband, and, or if you desire to be one, who knows in the future, these are God's ways for successful marriages. But first, the relationship that we have with one another is one in which we submit or which we humble ourselves. We show humility to one another. See, the problem is, and what we learn is that usually we want to have the upper hand on someone. Usually you want to have a power of position over someone. We want to have an angle over someone. That's a human way. That's human nature. We want to be one up on them, but not in the, not in the Christian world, not, not in the Christian faith. We follow the example of our Savior, and we unconditionally love them, and we don't, as we talked about last week, we don't calculate the benefits that I get from the relationship. We only consider what can I do to make the relationship better? How can I give of myself? So he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What, what that does, and, and I'll finish with this today, is that Christian faith teaches us that it, the relationships are enriched and, they, and dignity is brought to our relationship when we give more importance to the interests of others. This is found in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus uh, is described by Paul to have and consider the interests of others as more important than your own. In other words, the idea of the Christian faith is otherness is more important than one's personal interests. Other people's interests are more important than your own. It works. But that's what Jesus did, didn't he? You know that he left his glory in heaven a place where he had always been for all eternity. Had never known anything other than praise. And he steps down. And it's as if he took all of his divine privileges and prerogatives. I, know, I use that word quite a bit because that's the best way I know how to describe. When he, like, he puts all of that on a shelf. And he becomes a man knowing that someday he would rise from the dead in his death and he would ascend back into heaven and just go back and pick it up off the shelf and put it on again. 
You people are going to go, ah, what does it mean that Jesus, uh, you know, he reduced himself? Well, he became a man. It's like if you were to become an ant. You know, not your, you know, like a little insect. You would, to, I'm going to become an ant. It's like, but even that's really a fair comparison to the distance that he traveled to make himself like us. If we could just grasp for a second what he gave up to be like us, it would change our lives in so many different ways. And <laughs> someone comes over for a cup of sugar. I don't know if people are neighborly anymore. But what do you lose in giving someone a cup of sugar? Well, he gave his life. But it wasn't so much that he gave his life. It's who he was, who it was that gave his life. He's actually got the title of author of life. The author of life gave his life. There's no greater life. And he surrendered it at the cross for us. That's humility. And so when it talks about submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, we're considering what we're revering, we're respecting, we're, we're fear, we have an understanding. Of if He did that for us, it's no big deal for us to do it also at the level we're at. None of us would ever surrender what He surrendered to serve or to be able to submit to someone else's interests. Amen? Anyway, that's, our, that's the message for today. We're going to take the Lord's Supper here in a second. Let's pray for the sermon. Heavenly Father, we, we were looking at this, this passage and uh, it seems like some pretty simple stuff, but it's not due to the, the carnal nature that we have um, to voluntarily and by free will give up or surrender our rights seems like far-fetched, but it, there's nothing uh, closer to to the truth than, than that, Lord, because it's what exactly you did for us uh, as an example to us, as a way to uh, bring dignity and respect and true love into any relationship starts with humility. You demonstrated to, uh, that to us at the cross. And so we want to reflect on the cross here in a moment uh, in the Lord's Supper. And we want to thank you, Father, because we know that you have made the greatest of sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you for s such a wonderful love expressed at Calvary's cross that, that redeems us, that saves us. We don't even have an idea of what that actually means, but we will one day. And we'll praise you forever once we see it in, 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 in the light that, that is yours, Lord. Once we are exposed to the reality of what it is that you have done, we might be able to get a little bit of a taste of that now. But we pray, Lord, that you would continue to reveal yourself to us. Show us how great uh, a salvation we have. We'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.